This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Still on the Sermon on the Mount, there are so many things we have not covered in chapter 5, but we want to go over to chapter 6 and um, begin at verse number 9. But let's begin reading from verse 1. In the first, I would say, four verses. Jesus is talking about the right motive for giving. Take heed that he do not your arms before men to be seen of them, otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine arms, do not sound the trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men, Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest thine arms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. That time, or uh, that thine arms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth thee himself shall reward thee openly. It's good to remember what Jesus has taught on this subject. And this has, still has to do with what it means, what, we, what it would mean to live in his kingdom. And this has to do with the acts of righteousness, doing good and giving. Let's go over to verse number five. And when thou prayest, Thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray sounding in the synagogues or standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily say unto you, they have their reward. And thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in his secret. And thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when thou when, but when he pray, use not vain repetitions, as the heathens do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. And then verse 9, and after this manner therefore pray ye, O Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And then he says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive other de our, de our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. But before we get into this lesson, there are some questions we want to look at. You may write these questions down because we may, we may ask them again. And we hope you pay more attention to them this week. Then you'll ask a couple of weeks when you had assignments and didn't do any of the assignments. You remember the assignments that you had and only about two or three or four did the assignments. Now these assignments are important in order for us to remember what we talk about. Question number one. What is a prayer of thanksgiving? For that matter, if we look back, maybe we need to ask this question. For what did Jesus teach his disciples to pray? 
why did it why did he teach them to pray and what is the prayer of thanksgiving number one who should lead public prayers in the church what must the man lead in the prayer or why must he pray aloud enough to be heard With what attitude should prayer be made? What kinds of words should the leader use in prayer? How should prayers close and end? And tell some things, some of the things it is proper for the church to pray for. Oh, I'm going too, too fast, Brother Turner? Good. Good. We'll come back later. So the disciples are asking, Lord, teach us to pray. A, a, a question that entered my mind, why should they ask such a question? These men have been Jews all of their lives, have been going to the temple all of their lives. Don't they know how to pray? Maybe there's some things that Jesus Christ saying that would make them want to ask how to pray. He talked about giving, yes. He talked about um, adultery, he talked about marriage, he talked all these subjects are covered in chapters five and six. Maybe there's something they are missing. All of us, we came from somewhere. We prayed all the time. But have we ever asked ourselves, do I really know how to pray? What does the Bible say about me praying? What should I be praying for? When you look at verses 9 through 10 or 11, there are some words that are important. Prayer is about resting or surrender. Look at verse 9. We'll deal with this later, but just briefly look at verse 9. And after this manner, therefore pray, our Father which art in heaven. What manner after this manner? Pray. Prayer is resting. Or prayer is surrender. Here am I going to the Father Let's look at the attitude. Why am I going to the Father? Are there some things in my life, going on in my life, that I cannot control? Am I therefore to surrender to the one who knows all? Look again, look again what he says. Verse 9, after this manner therefore pray ye. Our Father. Why am I going to the Father? Am I not an adult? Can't I make my own decisions? Are there some things happening in my life that I can't control? So there's the idea of surrendering. Lord, you know that I just can't take care of this all by myself. Lord, there are some things that are just too heavy for me. Too much of a burden. Not only that, look at the next point. Prayer is about reverencing. Notice what he says. Our Father. Our Father. What does, what does that have to do with anything? Well, of course, yes, everything. Our Father, what am I admitting to? And when I say our Father, is it just an ordinary word? Am I dealing with my fellow men? Or is there someone who is so mighty? 
that he is not like an ordinary father on this earth, but the father of all. We go back to the beginning. He is the father of Adam. He is the father of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He is the father of Joseph. And now he is our father. But note, who is speaking? Is Jesus as a son saying, our father. So it's about reverencing. It's about admitting who God really is. It's about saying there's none like you. Prayer is about reigning. Remember again verse number 10. Thy kingdom come. Remember we said the first one was surrender. I must surrender to the leadership of Christ. The kingdom has to do with God reigning in our life. God has to take over. He is in charge. We know those are just words. Because truly when, when the push comes to shoving, we don't allow God to take charge at all. Now we know we pray for some things that are difficult and then after we have prayed about them, what do we do next? We go and we take up those things and we try to handle them ourselves. So it's about God reigning, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Of course, that will be done. Prayer is about what? Next one is resigning. Thy will be done. Suppose it's not my will. Suppose it's not the answer that I want. Suppose it's not the response I'm looking for. It has to be still. Thy will be done. So when Jesus now teaches disciples to pray, I wonder what they are thinking when, 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 when Christ says to them in verse number 10, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Do we really believe that? Do we really believe that God's will be done as it is in heaven, so it is on earth. So why do I try to change it so often? Why do I try to take control when I've given him over everything or some things? Are we not comfortable waiting for God? Or is it that natural tendency to do it for ourselves. So we have to resign to the fact that God is in charge. And I have to let him have his way. All right. Lord, give me a good night's rest. <laughs> and then I stay up all night long. What just happened there? Didn't God hear my, my prayer? In the process of staying up long, what were your thoughts? Were there some things on your minds you needed to have gotten rid of? Maybe God has answered your prayers indeed. He has given you time to reflect. On those things you just want to drop off and not things you need to take care of. There are some things we need to take care of. Remember we just read, you bring your arms before God and you remember, what? You got something against somebody? Leave your arms and then what? Go thy way. Maybe there are some things we need to take care of. Maybe that's why we can't sleep. I don't know. 
Maybe Brother Allen, he just cuss out Sister Allen. <laughs> Need to take care of that. Maybe that's why you can't sleep at night. But let's face it. What we are noticing is that we have to resign ourselves and let God rule without our interference. Prayer is about requesting. Look at verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, let, let's take those words and see what we can gather from them. Give us this day what? I think I remember a scripture says, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Sometimes we want more than what God wants us to have. Instead of asking for so much, why not thank God for what he has given us? Why not say, thank you, Jesus. Give us this day. All I ask, Lord, as I get up this morning, all I ask, Lord, take me through this day with what you want me to have. And thank you in advance. Thank you in advance, whatever it is. In whatsoever state I am, Paul says, I learned to what? To be content. That's not easy. Let's see if we can <laughs> take this a little further. Content with what? Content with what? Content with his daily supply of food. Content with the job he allowed us to have. Content with this or that. You'd be amazed that we spend so much time wanting to get ahead that we get ourselves into misery. Trying to get ahead. And when we don't get ahead where we want to, we say it's somebody's fault why I didn't get ahead. They try to hold me back. In whatever state I am, therewith to be content. So what's wrong if you apply and didn't get it? I still learn to be content. In God's own time, remember, he is in charge. He reigns in me. He is my king. He is my sustainer. He is my supplier. Prayer is about releasing. Look at verse 12. Forgive us our debt. It's like breathing a sigh of relief. Forgive us our debt. Take it all, Lord. Take it all. Then notice what it says. As we forgive our debtors. Now, we have, we have some good questions like, how can I forgive someone who has not asked forgiveness? Here's the problem. Here's the problem. Forgiveness so much is not about him or her. Is about God and my attitude towards him. I am sure there are some things that I have done I may not even have remembered that God, still, God has forgiven me. I may have covered a lot of grounds, but God still has forgiven me. So forgiveness really is not about the other person. It's about me not having any bad thoughts in my mind against anyone to, to hold me back. 
to burden me. Why am I burdened with somebody else's problem? Why am I burdened about something I can't change? I cannot determine how others feel. I can determine how I respond, how I act. That's what I have control of. So God says, Christ says in teaching disciples to pray and forgive us our debt as we forgive others. Prayer is about relying. Look at verse 13. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, thine is the power, thine is the glory. How long? For how long? Forever and ever. Let's look at that real line just a minute. Let's listen. In this verse 13, we can also say it's, it's really giving God praise. It's about praise and commitment. And lead us not into temptation. How is God going to do that? How is God not going to lead us in temptation? Yes, he does not tempt anyone to do evil. We know that. So what did he do with Abraham? In Genesis 22. Take your son, your only son, and kill him. I think there's something here that we need. It wasn't about God that we need to understand. It was about Abraham and his faith. Because after it was all over, God said, now I know. It's not that God didn't know before what was going to happen. But we have to go the whole nine yards to prove our faith. God is not going to put us in a situation where we can be easily tempted. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. There's no temptation. What? Come unto man where? They have no temptation taking you that is coming to man, but God will with, with that temptation make a way. See, Brother Allen, he loved to have paraphrase. So. <laughs> That's the man of paraphrase for you. But here's the thing, though, in that verse, as we find back in the book of Job. You remember when the devil... Of when God and the devil had a conversation about Job? When God says, has thou considered my servant Job that there is none in all the earth like him? How did the devil respond? Oh, Job is all that good because look what he did. He gave him everything and then he put a hedge around him. Put a hedge around him. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. God will not put us in any situation that is too much for us. He put a hedge around him. The devil doesn't have any more power to go beyond that. If you remember during the lifetime of Christ, even before that, the devil had power to take life. But after Christ came down from the cross, that power was crushed. The only power that the devil now has is what we give him. It's what we give him. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I want to go back to verse 11 again. When he talk about give us this day, our daily bread. When was the last time in your prayer you said, 
Thank you, God, for your daily bread. Without a hint of suggesting that I need more. The fact is, for most of us, if not, well, not all of us, most of us, we have all that we can control. We get a little bit more, we will spin out of control. Prayer is about rejoicing. Look at the praise. For thine is the kingdom thine is the power thine is the glory forever and ever i like these endings even in song i love these endings because they're showing us the attitude of the person speaking jesus exalts god he says everything belongs to you you got it you got it it's all in your hands now our lesson cannot cover every aspect of prayer and I won't attempt to do so tonight but it's some things we can look at prayer is a subject and discipline full of paradoxes what do we mean by paradoxes somebody Uh, full of paradoxes. That's a paradox. Yes, sir. Yeah. Sometimes, you, look, you, you ask for one thing, you get another. Most times, you get more than you ask for. You know what I remember? The book of Ruth. Here is Naomi coming home. Remember, Naomi, they belong to Bethlehem, the house of bread. There's a famine, so she and her husband and her two sons left. The house of bread to go to the land of Moab, a cursed place. While gone, she lost everything, the two boys and the, and the husband. She, she comes back, and what does she say? Now, no one forced her to leave. She left on her own. Now she comes back. She said, God cursed me. However, God is going to use her to get more blessings than she actually deserves. She is going to be Ruth's Oh, she's Ruth's mother-in-law. And she's going to be the one to steady that girl, to keep her straight. Because God is going to use Ruth to bring the Redeemer, Christ. Naomi did not anticipate this. She could not think about this. That God is going to bring a stranger. She is not a Jew. Ruth is not a Jew. God is going to bring her because of Naomi. And God is going to use her to bring Jesus Christ into the world. You just never know. You just never know. Life is filled with paradoxes. You ask for one thing. You, know, you complain about one thing and here God sends blessings. Praise is simple. It's simple and basic. And yet it is filled with complexities and nuances. Listen to Jesus as he teaches them to pray. It's not a long prayer. By any imagination. It's just a simple prayer. He's just teaching them how to pray. And yet there are so many complexes. So many things to think about. So many things going on at the same time. It's amazing. Prayer is sometimes put into words and verbalized. But other times prayer is just something in our hearts and minds and sometimes beyond words or thoughts. Has that ever happened to you? Then keep on living. 
Keep on living. I'm glad that I haven't had a speeding ticket. What I believe I could have had with, and, and, and not knowing I was speeding. Because sometimes in driving, I forget where I am. I really forget where I am. And I'm thinking thoughts about God. My wife, sometime we'll be together. Let's say we leave Sam's and we're headed home. And I'm thinking. And I pass St. Mary's Road. And she's not saying a thing. Coming around the corner to the building. And she looks at me. And she laughs at me. I say, what are you laughing at? She said, I thought you were going home. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I thought. But sometimes you get into thinking those deep thoughts. That you don't plan, but they just happen. And you can't always ex express, themselves, express yourself in words. I used to say, and I still believe that, when the old folks wanted to pray, especially if they had a, 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 a young man, a young woman out of control, they would say, Lord have mercy. You have no idea how much that really is. It's a lot of words that's not said. It's a lot of words that's not said. Those two little words or three little words, Lord have mercy with the right attitude. Lord have mercy. There's just so much said. And you can't always find the words to express them. Here's something for you to think about. Don't try it. Don't plan for it. You're sitting in your couch or on your bed and you're praying. And then you fall asleep. And you wake up two hours later and you ask, Did I close my prayer? <laughs> and you start over again. So, in order just to, to, to make myself feel good, you know what I say? If prayer is the last thing I'm doing before I go to sleep, I'll be all right. <laughs> I don't know, but. It's something to think about. It's okay to me. If it's not planned, but it happens, it happens. It happens. And there are times, I like what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and chapter 5. Especially chapter 5. Look at chapter 5, 2 Corinthians. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. Look at verse 2. For in this body we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. And if so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan. I take this literally. Being burdened, but not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, and that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Don't we groan sometimes? Don't you groan sometimes? I do believe with all my heart, this is what the Holy Spirit does for us. He translates our groaning into words before our Father. That's why you need the Holy Spirit. Sometimes you want to pray and the right words just don't come. You just say, Lord, you know what I mean. He knows. He knows. But this is not an excuse not to pray. But you understand. Sometimes prayer requires lots of time and attention and persistence and patience. But other times, it is brief and immediate. Don't feel badly because your prayer is short. It's okay. God doesn't judge your prayer by the length or by the amount of words you use, but by the sincerity of your heart. Because indeed, there are times what you want to say don't come out. Go. 
God knows what we need before we ask. Yet God wants us to ask. And he waits for us to ask. God has a will. And he wants it to be done. And yet works his will through our asking. Now we can pray like the psalmist would pray. We should utter those prayers. That's why we have this one. The psalmist would pray <laughs> about what his enemies should go through. <laughs> about God really cursing the, 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 the enemy. But here Christ teaches us to forgive those who trespass against us if we want his forgiveness. God promises to give us what we ask for and yet God reserves the right to say no or to give us something different and better than we ask for. I wish this was a private meeting that I could say what I wanted to say. All of us, it's not harsh, all of us pray for some things. We have plans in our minds what we want for others. But it's us, our plans. And there are times when God has other things in mind rather than what we think. We want, we, we, we are ambitious, we want this for our children, for our grandchildren. And when they don't produce what we think they should have, we say they are failures, and that may not be the truth. Because God can still use them in ways beyond what we can think. Listen. I don't pretend to know and to understand all there is to know about on, and understand about prayer, but that won't stop me from believing in the power of prayer and obeying God's command to pray. So should every disciple of Christ know, put in the, put in the question for me, what should every disciple of Christ know about prayer? What should you know about prayer? Number one, every Christian has the right to pray. You know why? Remember, Christ taught his disciples, our Father. He is not just Father of creation. He is father because we are his children by right of the new birth. He is our father because of the new birth. And just like our children have a right to call upon us because we are their fathers and mothers, we have a right to call upon God. He has given us that right. You are my children. I need to hear from you as you need to hear from me. A Christian should pray privately. Remember Philippians 4 and verse 6? Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. I like Acts chapter, five, chapter 12. It's a beautiful story of prayer. Peter is in prison. He's about to be killed. James has already been killed. And the Christians are meeting. It's seemingly Peter, Peter's sister's house. What are they doing? Praying. Sometimes I feel this, and this is personal. I believe they are praying, but I don't think they expected what ultimately happened, what finally happened. I don't think they expected that. True, they expected some miracle, but not, not that. For in the middle of the night, here comes Peter knocking on the door. 
Some young lady goes to the door and says, who is? She said, Peter. She ran in <laughs> to tell the others. They couldn't believe it. And what is beautiful about this is how God answered their prayers and how they reacted. Lord, I know you answered prayer, but this, Lord, have mercy. Thank you so much for delivering our preacher and our friend. And remember, one act of worship is prayer. So again, Lord, we say, teach us to pray. Remember that prayer is about rest in prayer, is about reverence in prayer, is about reigning, prayer is about resigning, prayer is about requesting. We'd almost say how many, eight or nine hours, or nine hours of prayer. All these we need to know and to learn and to do. We all have to pray. Finally, let's look at the one more time at the end of that, at the end or at the verses 9 through 12 or 13. Look at what's in that prayer. Look at what's in that prayer. In that prayer, there was praise to God. There was praise to God. This is not the time, but it would have been a nice time to talk about what praise really is because we have an idea what praise is today that is not scriptural at all. It's all about emotions. It's all about shouting and raising hands. That's not pra what praise was. It's acknowledging who God is. Our Father, which art in heaven, that's praise. Hallowed be thy name. That's praising. You know what praising is? If somebody, if you apply for a job, you have a biography, and somebody begin to read out the things about you, that's praise for about you. When we read about God, one of my favorite um, hymns about praise to God, O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the words thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. And it makes me want to sing how great the art. That's praise. That's what praise is. Sometimes you're home and, and, and for some reason you start thinking about God. You want to say something to yourself and to the empty room. Yes, it's all right, but don't come to church to say it. You're disturbing other folk. Because worship, remember, Acts, um, Hebrews chapter 10, consider one another. Consider one another. And you can't consider one another. We have been shouting down another. Everybody wants to hear and to listen and to learn. Pray. Lord have mercy. Pray. In prayer there was, or in this prayer, there was a promise of loyalty and submission to God's will. Let thy will be done on earth. There's a request for help with physical needs, a request for forgiveness, a request for strength to face temptations. Don't we sing it sometimes? Trials darken every hand. And we cannot understand all the ways that God would lead us to that blessed promised land. We wonder why the test, as we try to do our best, guess what? We'll understand it someday. By and by. Wow. The next time we meet, we'll talk about the different kinds of prayers. And those words we find like sub, um, su supplication and intercession and thanksgiving, we'll discuss those words. Could you pray? You could and you should 
if you're a Christian, if you're part of the family of God, if God is your father by reason of the new birth. And the new birth, according to John chapter 3, verses 3 and 5, involves attitude and water. Then you could pray. But if you have not participated in this new birth, then prayer, my friends, is wasted. God asks for your obedience first. Prayer is for obedient children. So God is asking you to obey. Hebrews 5, 8, and 9. He's even begging you to repent if you believe in Jesus. He's begging you to acknowledge before the world that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Then you become a child of God. And now you can pray. You don't know how refreshing that is to know, just to know, I can pray and God will hear me because I am his child then listen and then sometimes I mess up and I hear God says if we his children confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness there's a privilege that I have that when I sin my God is still willing to forgive me but I have to repent of those sins then you have to read the 51st Psalm and listen to David after, he, after God had forgiven him. He began to rejoice again. Then will I teach transgressors my ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee, he will say. Come to Christ this evening. Whatever your needs are, we are happy indeed to meet them, especially when they have to do with your salvation. Why don't come as together we stand and sing. And tenderly Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See, on the portals he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home. And